folks, here we go. Here's uh, little Emma. She's sound asleep. All right, that's what. Uh, it's pretty much all. All she does this this time of time of her life. She sleeps, wakes up, eats, poops, goes back to bed. That's about it. But she's doing great. Right, she's just hanging out. We got home from the hospital today. Can take one more day just to kind of figure things out with the other three here at school. I'll be back to see you guys on Tuesday in class. All right, so um, hope everything's going well. All right, you guys just took the quiz on the gospel evangelists. Um, so I'll take a look at those and get them back to you soon as we possibly possibly can. Just as a reminder, our project is going to be due on Wednesday this week. All right, so make sure that you're working on it. Uh, if you are procrastinated until now, the time for procrastination has kind of come to an end. All right, this is, this is it. Two days left. All right, you got this afternoon and Tuesday night, and then the project is coming in on Wednesday morning. I'll be back in class tomorrow, so this way if there's any last minute issues that you need to just kind of touch base with me on, please um, just let me know. You can email me and uh, we can go go from there. All right, make sure you're working on the homeworks. All right, uh, we're moving through those fast. Right? I'll be checking all the homeworks tomorrow in class when I come back uh, that I've had you guys do uh, since I was gone. So I think that's like four or five different homework assignments. So make sure that you've got those, those ready ready to go. All right, for today in class, what I want to do is I'm going to take a look at section seven and eight. Right, uh, last fireside chat on Thursday and Friday, we looked at sections three, four, five, and six. Right, we talked about John's prologue, we talked about the Annunciation and then the birth of John the Baptist, uh, and today we're going to be taking a look here at the Annunciation of the birth of Jesus. All right, so go ahead, uh, turn to section seven of your iBooks. I have in a backpack the, the notes that you're going to need, the highlights that you're going to need, so you want to make sure that you uh, you put those in there. Let's see, she's kind of flopsy-mopsy, right? She doesn't really do much because she's, she's really only 37 weeks, right? She's, uh, she came four weeks early, so she, <laughs> she, she doesn't really move much. She's so small, um, but she's healthy as, as an ox, so, so that's good to see. All right, so while... Uh, you guys hopefully now had your chance to go to section 7. We're taking a look at the Annunciation of the Birth of Jesus. Now, notice the first thing that I have you highlight there is the word Annunciation. The feast day of the Annunciation, right, falls every day on what day of the year? All right, I just want you to think here, think this through, right? The Annunciation is when the angel Gabriel tells Mary that she's going to become pregnant with the Messiah, with Jesus. All right, and so the date should be really easy to figure out because the birthday of Jesus, the day that Jesus is born, is what day? Good, December 25th, right, which is Christmas Day. And a child takes how long to grow inside the womb of its mother? No, not, it's not six months. No, that's kind of embarrassing for some of you guys. It's nine months. So if you just reverse the calendar nine months from December 25th, we get... March 25th, all right? So just put a note there right on the word Annunciation that the, we celebrate the feast day of the Annunciation every single year on March 25th. It's actually coming up next week, right, on Monday, right, one week from, from today, all right? Uh, so let's just go ahead and take a look here in verse 26 of Luke's Gospel, right? Remember, this is um, Luke's account of the infancy narratives that we're taking a look at. Remember, Luke is the one who spoke to Mary, so that's why this is long-winded. We get all these details um, from Mary here. All right, so in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. All right, just pause there, right? Notice, so Joseph is going to be the person, this marriage between Joseph and Mary is going to be the one who gives Jesus the heir to the Davidic uh, throne, right? So that's where we can say that the throne of David, the kingship of David, lasts forever, all right? Uh, so notice, just betrothed. What does it mean to be betrothed to a person, right? If you click on the did you know, it gives you a little bit of 
information. But basically, when people in our society think betrothal, they usually think engagement. Uh, whereas this time period before you're actually officially married, um, you know, and in today's society, it has all different meanings and it looks all, all different. Uh, but the idea of a betrothal, actually, believe it or not, uh, tells us that Mary and Joseph were actually truly married. So in the Hebrew sense, back in the Jewish culture, a man and woman would have been uh, arranged to be married, right? So, uh, you know, the mom and dad of each, you know, spouse, right, would arrange their marriage uh, and kind of set that up. That was almost like harmonic engagement. Uh, and then there was this period of betrothal where you are married, you are man and wife, but you don't live together yet. The man has a certain period of time to go out and um, secure for himself a house um, and enough funds in order to prove that he uh, can support his new wife, right, because this was in large part a livelihood for, for the family. Right, he was going to be the, the, the sole and only breadwinner, bringing in all, all the money. And before the father let his daughter go and live with him, he needed to make sure that uh, he was, in fact, going to be able to take care of his, uh, of his daughter. So that's a betrothal, right? So they're married, but they're not living together. And then finally, once the betrothal is over, then the wife would move in. All right? So the idea here is that... Why am I making such a big deal about this? Because when we get to Matthew's Gospel, we find the detail out here that they are betrothed, and it almost appears that Joseph wants to leave Mary because of this uh, announcement of the birth of her being pregnant, right? And that it would somehow be considered uh, scandalous if Mary would be, uh, have a child now with Joseph before they actually were married. Because they are, they are married, right? They are married. This isn't scandalous. Um, in, any, in any way, shape, or form. All right, so moving on here, right? Uh, betrothed to Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary, right? So just, it's important to know that Mary was a virgin, um, and she will continue to remain a virgin for the entirety of her life, all right? Verse 28, coming to her, that's the angel Gabriel, he said to her, Favor, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you, all right? Um, that's an interesting greeting, right? Because we've never before in any of the gospel stories that we've looked at or ever will look at, because it's the only time we ever see an angel greeting a human being with that title. Hail, favored one, right? The Lord is with you. A lot of times it's also translated hail, full of grace. Right? You can put that note there. Right? Hail, full of grace, right? The Lord is with thee, right? Which is, of course, the first words of our Hail Mary. All right, hail full of grace, right? This is where we see the evidence for what we call the Immaculate Conception, that Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother without uh, any stain of original sin. All right, and Mary's like troubled greatly. She's like, what kind of greeting is this? Because she knows her scripture. She's a good Jewish young lady. Uh, and she's like, that. No, no angel has ever greeted anybody like that before. Like, what, is, what does he mean? Right? And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of God, Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And in his kingdom there will be no end. Right? So J the angel Gabriel kind of delivers the message. This is what uh, we're going to be doing here. Keep hitting the bell button. The parking chair. Do that. Um, sorry, Emma. Right, um, delivers the message, right? You are going to conceive and bear a child. Now, notice in verse 34, Mary simply has like a question, right? How is this going to be since I have no relations with a man? Now, this is different than Zechariah. A lot of you guys might be sitting there going, time out, wait a second. Zechariah said the same thing. Um, basically, like, don't you know that me and my wife are advanced in age? Right? And the angel Gabriel takes it as like, Zechariah is somehow doubting what uh, God is capable of doing. But when Mary says, how can this be, since I have no relations with a man, it, it, you need to, we need to understand a little bit more about who Mary was, right, as, as a human being, as a person, who Joseph was as a person, to kind of really uh, stretch this out, right? Evidence is showing us that Mary probably has dedicated her life to God as a perpetual virgin, right? So what she's saying here. Um, is more, would be better translated, 
how can this be? Because God knows that I have made this vow to him to remain a virgin my entire life, and he would never ask me to go against the vow that I've made, right? God would never ask me to go against the vows that I've took in my, taken in my marriage. Uh, he would never ask the vows of Brother Ken that he's taken uh, as, as a brother, right, to go against those vows. He never asked the vow, uh, Father Tom to go against the vows that he's taken as a priest. God would never ask us to go against the vows that we have taken for him um, as a way in which we're going to live out our holiness. And so Mary's saying, how is this going to happen? Because I'm pretty sure I know how babies come from, where they, where they come from, right? And at the same time, I promise never to do that for God, and, and I, don't, I don't know how he would ask me to, to do one without the other, right? And that's when the angel in verse 35 just kind of answers, right? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born shall be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, right? So, um, I'll keep reading. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, he has also, she has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her, whom was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God, right? Uh, and so the angel Gabriel says, look, the Holy Spirit is going to come and power you, uh, and you will conceive through the power of the Holy Spirit. And proof, right, that this can happen is the fact that Elizabeth is with child six months in. Now, when we go back to all of these barren women, to all of these miraculous births that we've seen throughout the Old Testament, they are all setting the stage for this moment, right? If you understand the idea of a woman who's barren, right, it basically means that biologically speaking, right, she is no longer to have children because she's run out of, out of eggs to be fertilized. Um, and so for God to give a barren woman a child, we're basically saying, all right, I'm going to provide another egg. and I'm going to fix the biological problem that, that's missing, right? Uh, with like H Hannah or some of these women who were just sterile, right? God is going to fix the problem. Here, we, with the virgin birth of Jesus, it's the same thing as being barren, but just flip it, right? Instead of not having the, the part, the biological parts for the woman, now she doesn't have the biological parts for the man, and, and no big deal, right? So if we're going to accept all these miraculous births of these barren women throughout the Old Testament, I mean, it's really not that hard of a leap to, to believe that, that Mary could conceive here through the Holy Spirit, right? As evidenced by all these other women who were barren leading up to her, last among them being Elizabeth, her cousin, who is pregnant at this time. Verse 38, right? This is what we refer to as Mary's fiat. It comes from the Latin meaning, may it be done, right? And it comes from her words, her response. Mary, in response to the angel, says, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord, May it be done to me according to your word. All right? Um, I, I think if you really understand that verse, right, there's, there's two parts. So you can put a note that this is Mary's fiat. But if you understand uh, what Mary is saying there, let it be done to me. She's saying yes, right? This, God is not forcing her to be the mother of God. God is not forcing her to say yes to this. She is being asked to do this, and he is saying, she's saying, you got it. I'm all in. The second thing, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Now, a handmaid, sometimes you're kind of like, oh, yeah, that's just somebody who helps out somebody else. No, a handmaiden was, was basically like the servant of the master who knew the, what the master wanted before the master would even ask it. That's how in tune to the needs of the master that a handmaiden was required to be. Almost as if, like if you're eating dinner, as the master would go to reach for his cup, the handmaiden would already know that that the master is going to be looking for a drink and would hand that drink to the master, right? That's how close her relationship with God is. That's how in tune she is to what God wants her to do in her life. All right? Oh, you okay? Sorry, I didn't mean to hit you. I hit her leg and she started a little bit. All right. All right. So if we turn the page. Last thing, just a note here in the. Uh, in, in the commentary somewhere, we need to just make sure we know who Mary's parents are. All right, Mary's mom and dad are St. Anne and St. Joachim. All right, once again, the notes are in the backpack, so you can just copy that, that note over. All right, lots of things to click here. Um, a lot of this is what I just, just kind of talked about. Section 8, the visitation of the Magnificat. I always find this unbelievable, right? Verse 39, during those days, Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste. 
to the town of to a town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now, what's going on here? Mary, she's probably 15, 16 years old. She was just told she's going to have a child, right? A child, right, that is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Um, and nobody would feel bad or would somehow hold it against Mary if Mary was like, wow, I need to just sit back and think this through. All right, what just happened? But Mary doesn't do that. She, she in haste, right, straps on her sandals and travels all the way down to Judah. Now, she's in Nazareth. If you go back to section 1 and look at that map, she's in Nazareth, which is in Galilee, which is in the north. And she's going to travel south in haste as fast as she can. A pregnant Mary, which I don't know if you guys know, this first month of pregnancy is usually pretty rough, right? Nauseous feelings. Um, and she's going to travel in haste to go and serve her cousin. Right? Mary gives us a wonderful, wonderful example of what it means to serve other people here. She does not think for a second, oh my gosh, my life has just been turned upside down. She doesn't think, holy cow, this is great. I am the mother of God. This is fantastic. Right? She doesn't, none of that. She just goes, my cousin Elizabeth is in need. She needs help, and I'm going. And she gets down. She doesn't hop in her, in her Audi, right, with the climate-controlled uh, air-conditioned seats, right, and the heated steering wheel. Uh, she probably hops on a donkey, or she walks, right, all the way down to Judah. And I notice, right, she gets there, verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leapt in her womb. Who's that infant? Who's the child that Elizabeth is pregnant with? Yeah, yeah, it's it's John the Baptist. John the Baptist, right? <laughs> this is this is this is fantastic, right? Um, John the Baptist, by leaping upon hearing the voice of Mary, John the Baptist becomes the first person in the world, the first person in the Gospels to announce. The, and recognize the presence of the Messiah. And where is John? John is still in the womb of his mother. And where is Jesus? Jesus is still in the womb of his mother. Right? Guys, this is one of the reasons why the church teaches what it does about the sanctity of human life and just how precious human life is. Um, you know, that, that John the Baptist, before he's even born, he's already fulfilling his mission, right? To proclaim and to make people ready for the Messiah. Um, and he's doing that before, before he's even born. All right, and Elizabeth, I'm going to continue reading now. And Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice, said, Most blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. All right, so that's just the second half of the Hail Mary, right? We already saw the first half, greeting from the angel, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Second half, right? And blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. All right, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. All right, and then she asks her, how does it happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb of the joy. Blessed are you who believe that what was spoken to you by the Lord would not be fulfilled. Would be fulfilled. Now that's a little dig at her husband, right? Where the angel Gabriel says to Zechariah, hey, you can do this. And he says, no. And now she, he's paying for it because he's mute for the last six months. Um, and she says to Mary, hey, blessed are you because you listened to the angel. My, my husband, okay, look at this guy. Guy can't talk. It's been the best, best six months of my life. The guy can't talk anymore. Um, but blessed are you for, for recognizing what God is saying to you, and then actually, actually doing, actually fulfilling it. All right. Men, now notice, like it would be easy for Mary to be puffed up. For Mary to be like, "You're right. You're right. Blessed am I. I am pretty awesome. Right. I am first among first. I'm. I'm the best. Right." But Mary doesn't do that. She spits out what we call the Canticle of Mary, also known as the Magnificat. Right, which is said by the church during evening prayer every single night. So remember the Benedictus, the Canticle of Zechariah, said during the morning, and now we see the Magnificat being said during evening prayer. And notice she spits out this, right? She says, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Right, so when Mary's saying to, I'm sorry, when Elizabeth says to Mary, How great you are, Mary says, No, 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 no. Not how great I am, but how great God is for what he's doing through me. He has looked upon his handmaid's loneliness. From now on, all ages will call me blessed. They're going to call me blessed 
because of what God has done for me. He's blessed me. I'm not doing anything, right? She is just completely humble throughout all of this. The Almighty is the one that has done great things for me. Holy is his name, right? And you can keep reading on from there. Remember, of course, we said that that was the type for the song of Hannah from the, um, from the book of Samuel. All right. Last thing just to note before I let you guys go, page 22, there's a nice little chart here on Matthew and Luke's Gospels. Right? What this chart is doing, right, it, it's telling us the difference between Luke's infancy narratives and Matthew's infancy narratives. Now, we've been looking at Luke's infancy narratives so far, right? and you've already noticed it's focusing on the person of Mary. Right? Uh, we're going to see in a second in the next chapter, we'll look at this tomorrow, that the first people and the only people to visit Jesus in Luke's Gospel are the shepherds after he's born. Right? And the message in Luke's Gospel is that Jesus came for all people. Also, what you need to add to this is that Luke's genealogy, right, the descendants that he traces Jesus all the way back to goes all the way back to Adam in Luke. He traces Jesus' genealogy, his family tree, all the way back to Adam. Now, that's unbelievable. That's remarkable. I can barely trace my genealogy back two generations, three generations. And Luke's able to get Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam. Matthew's a little different. Matthew focuses on the person of Joseph because he's trying to make it seem as though Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures, right? He's here for the Jewish converts. And as such, the people that visit Jesus at his birth are the three wise men, the three kings, right? And that makes sense. What do other kings do when baby kings are born? They go and they, they visit. All right, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as the week goes on. All right, page 23, I'll leave you this, with this, is this, this chart. Once again, we looked at this back in the Old Testament of how the Ark of the Covenant is a type for the pregnant mother of God, Mother Mary. All right, and there's the manna, which is the bread that comes down from heaven inside the Ark. Mary contains inside of her the Eucharist, the body of Jesus Christ. The Ten Commandments, which are the word of God written down on um, on its own tablets. Mary has inside of her this eternal word of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Logos, that we talked about from the prologue of John's Gospel. And then finally, the last thing, the staff of Aaron represents the high priesthood of, of, of Aaron and the Levites, where Jesus, of course, is the high priest who's going to offer this eternal sacrifice to God for us. All right? So when I come back to class tomorrow, we'll be taking a look at section 9, all right, and which is the birth of Jesus according to Luke. You guys know the story, so we should be able to move fairly quickly through through sections 9, 10, uh, and 11 tomorrow. All right, if you guys need anything, please feel free to email me today during the day um, so that I can, uh, I can help you guys out with your project. Any questions you have, uh, feel free to see me. All right, hope all is well. All right, I'm going to pause this thing. I think this thing logged out again because I got a little long-winded. All right, yeah, I did. So, say goodbye, Emma. I got this feeling. Yeah, she's still sleeping. Inside my bones. All right, guys. Have a good day. It goes right electric, out. wavy when I turn it on. Off from my city, off from my home. We're flying up, no ceiling when we. Come here. Baby. Wow. Hi. 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 Can you give her a kiss, Charlie? Mmm.